Surendra Bhatia, Deputy MD, Arthur River Cement, thank you so much for taking time to speak with me today. You've just released your first half results. Can you just talk us through it? It was quite a strong organic story, I thought. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, the demand and uh, the revenue grew by 2% year on year as compared to the first half last year. But if we compare ourselves with the second half of last year, our revenues grew 24%, which is a significant growth. Uh, the revenues were driven. So that's, that's if you c compare it sequentially. Sequentially, yes. Uh, you know, the cement demand is uh, seasonal, and uh, the you know normally the first half of the year is always slower than the second half because the second half we the rains are not there, the construction activity picks up. But last year there was a change of pattern, so the first half was better than the second half. But if we compare uh, in terms of the seasons, I think this year. Uh, we have grown by 24% as compared to the second half last year. The sales has been uh, driven by increased sales of cement, both in Kenya and Tanzania, as well as a significant increase in our fertilizer turnover. Mm -hmm. Our fertilizer has virtually doubled within the first six months of this year. So strong growth from yes. all the divisions, uh, strong growth from the Tanzanian side, mm -hmm. and uh, overall. C can I just talk about the macro picture for cement and uh, East Africa d double digit growth? What did we see in your key markets, which are Kenya and Tanzania? The Kenyan market grew by over 12 percent this yes. year, and the growth was driven in essentially by the infrastructure segment. Uh, the housing demand for us is still uh, very nascent. I mean, uh, the housing demand has always grown by double digits for the last 15 years. So, infrastructure, housing demand both contributed to the growth of the cement market. In Tanzania, the story was also the same. The market grew by more than 11 percent. And uh, this, despite being an election year in Tanzania, uh, the demand was significant from the infrastructure segment. Housing demand, uh, very, very stable. If we go to Dar es Salaam, we probably see more tower cranes than we see in any other part of East Africa. Is that right? Uh, so uh, strong demand uh, from the housing sec uh, sector in uh, Tanzania also. So overall, mm. And do you project this kind of double-digit growth for the next few years? Well, if we look at the per capita consumption, both in Kenya and Tanzania, we are still less than 100 kgs per person per year. Now, if we co uh, compare it with any other developing uh, country, we would see that uh, any other country at this stage of its economic development would have about 200 to 250 kgs per person. So we are right at the beginning of the curve. Uh, if you look at our housing demand, I mean, uh, we believe uh, if you just look at Nairobi, we need 200,000 housing units every year. And uh, the uh, num amount of houses which we are constructing or flats which we are constructing in Nairobi is less than 20,000 a year. So a significant demand, I think uh, we are right at the bottom of the consumption curve. And if we were to project the next five years, I feel East Africa as a whole would grow more than 10 percent year on year for the next, ten, uh, next five years. Okay, and, so, and then what about, if I can, before I go into the minutiae of the numbers, uh, what about the supply side? You know, we hear frequent announcements of new capacity coming on stream in the region. Is capacity coming on stream keeping up, or is it ahead of this very strong demand curve you've described? Well, we need to uh, uh, divide the cement uh, supply side into two uh, segments. One is the clinker side mm -hmm. of supply. Now, in Kenya today, every manufacturer is importing clinker. Mm -hmm. And therefore, from a clinker perspective, we are in an undersupply situation. Yes. Now, clinker is semi-finished cement. It is 80% of your final product. And that is in short supply. All the six manufacturers are importing it. If we look at the grinding capacity, which is importing the clinker and then grinding it into cement, uh, that is in oversupply. Maybe uh, the total demand in Kenya is about 5.5 million tons. On the supply side, we are 6.5 million tons. So yes, on the grinding side, we are, uh, we are oversupplied. But on the clinker side, which is the heart and soul of cement. Yes, 80 percent, you say. 80 percent. And we are importing uh, clinker. Yes. We are, as a country, we are importing more than 1.5 million tons of clinker mm. into Kenya. Now, in terms of the new capacities which have come up, most of the new capacities which have come up are in the area of grinding capacity. They are not the clinker capacity. So going forward, ERM has a, has a strategy of being a clinker player. Yes. So we are a player in the undersupplied segment of the cement rather, rather than on the cement side. And in Tanzania, of course, you put on a big clinker facility in Tanga. Can you just talk us, talk us through that facility and, and characterize, is it the same situation you're describing in 
Kenya and Tanzania? Or? Absolutely. I mean, even in Tanzania, uh, every other manufacturer, including ARM, till the end of 2014 was importing clinker. Mm -hmm. Now we have five or six manufacturers and all of them in Tanzania were also importing clinker. Uh, the, the, the reason we put up the clinker capacity is because we wanted to be self-sufficient in clinker. And being a clinker player gives us the cost advantage mm -hmm. over imported players. So describe to me what that cost advantage looks now, like. Or importing clinker is nearly 75% more expensive mm -hmm. than manufacturing your own clinker. Mm -hmm. In the cement business, the value chain is captured by the clinker manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And being a clinker manufacturer gives us the flexibility of being able to produce different kinds of cement. Yes. We are probably the only com uh, one of the few companies in the region which can produce 52.5, mm. which is the highest grade of cement which is used. Uh, we have. Are we seeing a trend towards higher grade cement? Yes, as the uh, construction becomes. Uh, uh, more advanced, we have uh, multi-story buildings coming up, we have uh, high-rises coming up. The demand, uh, this, the quality of cement uh, increases and the demand therefore is for a higher grade of cement than for the 32.5 which we have been used to for normal construction. So yes, there is a, now for infrastructure projects, for example the SGR railway yes. or for the gas pipelines which yes. you, you would need the 52.5 grade of cement. Now, we are the only or probably one of the few companies in the region where we have a KBS certificate for 52.5 as well as a Tanzania Bureau of Standards certification for 52.5. What has allowed us, uh, given us this uh, strength and that is our ability to produce clinker and then convert it into different grades of cement, yes. the higher grade of cements included. And, and this, uh, this clinker, if you dimension the advantage, what is it? You know, what is the financial advantage of, of, of making your own clinker? Will your EBITDA margins double yes. if you manufacture your own clinker? It's as much as that. As much as that. So yes. if you're importing clinker, your EBITDA margins are probably half of what you would yes. manufacture. And uh, as I said, the value chain of the cement business is captured in the manufacture yes. of clinker. Okay. Mr. Bhatia, looking at the results, uh, the finance costs went out from 220 million to 627 million. So the optics of that is quite a sharp increase. Can you just tell us the background story to that, please? As far as uh, the IFRS regulations are concerned, the standards are concerned, during the construction phase of the project, the interest costs are not expensed to the income statement. They are actually capitalized to the project. Now, Till last year, the Tanga project was under construction and therefore a significant part of the interest cost was actually capitalized to the project cost. This year, the Tanga project, uh, clinker project is fully operational. In fact, we are operating to 70% of our capacity. Therefore, as per as the international standards, we have to expense the interest to the income statement. Mm. So though you may see a sharp increase in the income statement, if you look at the cash flow statement, you would find that our interest burden was this nearly the same as compared to last year. Oh. The only thing is classification has changed. Yes. From it being capitalized to the project cost, it is now being expensed in the income statement. Excellent, thank you. And profit before tax was actually down at 945 million in part because of the treatment of the interest expense. Interest expense. Yes, okay. Um, now, obviously, everyone's going to focus in on the unrealized uh, uh, exchange losses that you've booked of 1.418 billion shillings. Now, we all know that we've been in a very volatile environment. African currencies generically have been soft. Can you tell us the story around uh, the exchange? Now, as per, again, the international accounting standards, uh, we need to provide uh, for the unrealized exchange losses which we have on our books. Now, we have a significant amount of dollar-based debt. Yes. The reason we took the dollar-based debt was because it matched with our expense. Most of the equipment which we were importing for the projects was in dollars. Mm -hmm. The second was that the dollar interest rates is always uh, more competitive than yes. the local currency interest rates. So, it was far more cost-effective in uh, method of raising capital. But due to the depreciation, mm. we have to provide for the losses on the entire amount yes. of the dollar-based debt. Yes. Now, the repayments for these debts do not occur in this year. They occur over the next, uh, in the future, over the next couple of years. 
And as a strategy, what the company has always done is that we have hedged our forex risk against the dollar-based earnings for the future years. Over the five years, we would earn the dollars which are required to pay our debt. So as a company, we feel that while we have provided for the unrealized exchange loss, this may not actually result into a realized exchange loss going forward. They would be uh, probably mitigated by the fact that we have a significant dollar-based earnings, which we would use to pay off our dollar-based loans and liabilities. So we actually saw a similar occurrence happen, I think, in 2011, when the shilling similarly fell very sharply to about 107. And I think you actually also then um, uh, treated, the, treated it uh, as you have done this time, but you were able to write back that provision uh, Absolutely quickly. correct, yes. yes. In 2011, the same thing happened. At that time, we were uh, we probably were fortunate that the currency strengthened back. Yes. Uh, we are hopeful as a, uh, as a country that the currency would again come back. But even if it does not, mm. even if uh, the currency depreciates, uh, uh, we are covered going forward by yes. our dollar earnings to offset these Yes. exchange losses. However, as per IFRS, we have to provide for them now. Mm. Okay. So you're, you're, you're confident that um, this is a mark-to-market uh, situation, you're going to be amortizing it if it stays this way over five years, and p possibly with a right back if, if the currency bounces. Absolutely correct. Now, somebody was telling me that actually this is working to your advantage, this weaker currency, because it's making the imports uh, more expensive in the local markets and, and actually that, you, that, that there is a possibility that this plays in your favour. Is that a fair characterization? Yes, because uh, as I was mentioning, I mean, everybody else is importing clinker. Now, the clinker imports are in dollars. Therefore, obviously, their raw material cost goes up because of the depreciation. Uh, as a local manufacturer of clinker, most of our costs are in the local currency and therefore we are not impacted to the same extent as an importer of clinker would be. So yes, it, gives, it increases our competitive advantage over the other manufacturers in the cement industry. Uh, also, the finished cements which are coming into either Tanzania or Kenya are a dollar-based commodity. They become more expensive. Uh, our selling price continues to be in the local currency and therefore that again adds to our competitive advantage in the cement industry in the local market. Excellent. If I can just go through the numbers, so a profit uh, before tax, loss before tax is 473.516 million. This is a, taking the entire hit on the FX. Um, and uh, profit after tax three, uh, minus 355.8 million versus a profit of 847.22 um, million last time round. And just to just to confirm, EPS was negative one shilling 44 cents uh, versus uh, three shillings and 40 cents last time. But as you said, you think that you know that there is noise on the on, on these earnings because of the FX, and you've. You've, you've described um, the situation, which I thank you for. Um, if I can just touch on uh, a couple of other things, um, is there anything else you wanted to add about the results that you think? I think, uh, you know, uh, except uh, the, the fact that the Tanzania plant uh, yes. got uh, delayed due to power reasons by three months. Yeah, I think tell us about that because what? Pradeep told me quite an interesting, he said you, you drew more power, I, I can't remember what he said. Well, uh, you know, uh, you uh, blew up the grid I think. Uh, uh, well, uh, you know, this is the largest single line cement plant in East Africa and yes. therefore we are consuming a significant amount of power. Uh, I believe we are the single largest load on the grid uh, yes. in Tanzania. In Tanzania. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, uh, you know, uh, we were drawing more uh, power from the grid than the capacity which the grid has, as a result of which it was resulting in a low voltage dip, which was uh, uh, you know stopping our plant. Our plant is fully automatic, and it is, has a low voltage protection. So the moment the voltage dropped, because we were drawing more current, uh, we were having a problem. We have not been able to uh, work and engage with Tenisco as well as with the local authorities and being able to come out of this issue. Yes. The plant today is operating well. Yes. Uh, we are operating at 70% capacity already. Yes. And it is, uh, if everything goes to plan, then within the next three months, we would be operating to full capacity. Yes. Uh, we are therefore producing more clinker than we consume ourselves. So what do you do with the... Uh... The clinker we are actually supplying to a number of other cement players who are importing. So uh, 
instead of importing, they are buying it from us. Yes. Uh, we are uh, selling clinker to our own clinker, uh, to our own cement plants in Kenya. In Kenya, we have a capacity of a million tons, yes. but our clinker capacity is just 650,000 tons. Yes. So about one third of our total clinker requirements in Kenya are met with imported clinker. Now, instead of importing it, we are now supplying the Kenyan plants from Tanzania. Yes. Uh, we have also exported the clinker into Rwanda and into DRC. Yes. So uh, we are, instead of selling cement, we are selling clinker. In terms of our uh, EBITDA returns and our yes. margins, operating margins, they are the same. Yes. Uh, so uh, were margins not higher from the previous six months? because of the clinker? It is, because yes. if you look at our EBITDA margins, uh, at the end of last year we had an EBITDA margin of 23 percent, and now it's increased to 25 percent, yes. and the increase has been driven by the use of locally manufactured clinker. Okay. Now the fastest growing piece of the entire empire we touched on at the beginning is of course the fertilizer business. Can you, you, you told me what was the growth of, of six month on six months in terms of total revenue because I think that gives an idea of how fast the growth has been. Well, we have grown in the cement uh, by nearly two and a half times. Yes, Our first fertilizer. In the fertilizer, uh, two and a half times. Uh, uh, first six months last year as compared to first six months. And that is essentially because um, crop specific, soil specific, yes. non-acidifying, mineral rich, mono fertilizer is today being accepted mm. by the county governments, by the, central go uh, by the central government in Kenya as the way forward yes. for increasing uh, yields yes. uh, on our crops. Uh, the land is not increasing. Mm. Uh, the only way we can bring in food security in Africa is to increase the yields. And crop specific, soil specific fertilizer, in very simple terms, gives the right nutrient mm. to the right crop for mm. the right soil. Yes. And you've, you're, you're saying two and a half times year on year, what total fertilizers revenue? Yes, uh, our uh, fertilizer sales has yes. increased two and a half times in the first six months. And, and, and how, I mean, can this trajectory continue? Are you excited about it? I mean, are we going to continue to, or is this an exponential part of the okay. curve? No, I mean the total demand of fertilizers in Kenya itself is more than 500,000 tons. Yes. Our capacity today is just 50,000 tons. So yes. we are just catering to about 10% of the market and therefore the potential to grow is tremendous. Mm -hmm. Uh, however, fertilizer is a seasonal business. Yeah. We sell in two seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, the major season has just passed, which is the long rains. Um, therefore, the growth in the second half uh, we expect would be the same. Mm -hmm. uh, Going forward, yes, we yeah. feel there's a tremendous potential and if we can put in the right investment in this business, the growth will continue. Now, when I was looking through uh, your release, you're seeing a very big second half skew in terms of your forecast for 2015 turnover, sees a very big gain uh, in the second half. Um, and similarly, in the EBITDA margin, it's, you're seeing a, a margin improvement and a substantial gain. Why are you so bullish about the second half? Uh, on the EBITDA margins, it's very simple. Our uh, clinker plant actually got operational somewhere in April. Uh, it was uh, uh, operating stably from April. And now, the next six months, we are going to be using the local clinker. Yeah. Uh, also, the clinker sales is going to be increasing our total revenue. Mm. Uh, we were not selling as much of clinker in the first, uh, in the second quarter of this year because we just got, we were ramping up capacity. Now we'll be at full capacity, so we'll be selling both cement, clinker, yes. as well as so replacing. You're firing on all cylinders, second half. Is what second half, yes. <laughs> um, a, 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 a couple of other things, if I might touch on. I think it's been w widely telegraphed that you're looking to refinance some of your short-term borrowing um, with a five-year bond. Can you just talk us through what you're doing there? Yes, we have appointed uh, Standard Chartered Bank, uh, Stanton Big Bank and Barclays Bank to restructure our short-term debt. The objective is to convert the short-term debt into medium-term five-year debt. Um, that is to uh, ensure that uh, the repayments, uh, uh, we have the ease of repayments over the next five years. Uh, we are at a stage where the banks have uh, put across the uh, information memorandum and yes. have been speaking to the investors. We hope to be in the market within the next three months. Yes. Uh, the in initial indications from the MLS is that the bond would be 7.5 billion shillings. Yes. Um, this is, however, what they have proposed. We have not finalized, but we are looking at raising 7.5 billion shillings through a five-year bond uh, in the local market. And you'll be going to market soon? And uh, we should be there in the next two months. Yes. 
So, if, if, so just to wrap up, if we're looking at those results, good organic growth, you, you've pointed out a very bullish story as, as, the, as the Tanga facility comes on, on stream fully. You've painted a picture of double-digit growth um, in, in East Africa. What, what should shareholders be looking forward to? Um, I think uh, improved performance, improved earnings uh, as we go forward. Uh, as we fully utilize all the capacities which we have built up. I think the hard par uh, part of the work has been done. Uh, building up the Klinger plant in Tanga was probably the toughest part of the journey. Uh, we have done that. It's now getting the uh, capacities up and running and uh, increasing the performance of the company as well as shareholder value. And you know, Arm has grown tremendously from the time it listed in 1997. Um, it's nearly 20 years now since it, since, since it listed. Do you still see the uh, growth curve like that or would you say you're playing an offensive game right now or are you playing a consolidative game, you're trying to sort of consolidate your game? How would you characterise where, where you are? If you analyse our growth over the last 15-20 uh, years, you would see that we've always had uh, stages of growth, consolidation, followed by growth, yes. consolidation. And we've con completed a major uh, growth uh, yes. project which is Tanzania. Over the next two years, we feel it will be the consolidation period. Yes. So over the next two years, which is 2015, 2016, our focus would be to get the uh, uh, capacities running to full capacity, get the markets, uh, get your products into the market, uh, improve your financial performance, reduce your debt. Mm. 2017 onwards, you know, we would again, once again, look at the next growth strategy. So for over the next two years, consolidation, but over the next five years, growth again. <laughs> You know, uh, it, when people invest in the frontier markets, they always say invest in BBC, beer, um, I can't remember what the other B and C is, cement. Now, there are choices for people to invest in. I bought Bamburi is here, Portland Cement, yourselves. Mr. Dan Goethe speaks about how he's headed this way, and I think he's doing something in southern Tanzania. What makes you the best place for investors in cement in East Africa? I know operationally, you know, you've proven that you've that you're able to deliver plant at cheaper cost. You're more efficient. Do you think that still stands? You have all of that in place. Well, I think that is probably the biggest strength we have as a company: being able to keep the capital costs down, uh, being able to uh, manufacture cement at a cost which is significantly lower than the others. Now. We would uh, probably, uh, as a company, want to position ourselves as the lowest cost manufacturer of cement in the region. Uh, that gives us the long-term competitive edge to succeed in the market. Mr. Bhatia, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.